Professor Dubrai is uh, joining us from uh, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, today he's going to present on interconnecting the foreign language curriculum, uh, new interfaces, and critical cultural studies. And we're going to hear about a very interesting uh, program uh, or collaboration between uh, the French and German, uh, his colleague in the German department, uh, which I think might have some interesting you know, possible applications amongst some of our programs here. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more, and uh, thank you for coming to the question. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, if you have cell phones, tablets, laptops, any other electronic kinds of devices, make sure you uh, have them readily available, turn them on, because uh, that might come in handy. <laughs> you never know. <clears throat> I usually, uh, that's how I open a class when I, when I uh, talk to my students and they're really wondering if I'm for real or, as they say in the audience, for true, you know? <laughs> is that for true? Uh, uh, it is, it is for true. So, uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, thank you, Steve, and now thank you again who is, uh, uh, for your uh, warm welcome and, and inviting me. I'm very happy to be here braving the cold and uh, Friday the 13th and Friday afternoon and you're all here, so it's <laughs> Nice of you to come. Um, so I, I always like to uh, start with a little bit of a, of a quote. Um, and uh, I find Steve Fromm to be a very eminently quotable character. And so uh, his idea, one of his uh, more recent publications in 2011, he uh, concludes by saying that the goal of uh, foreign language instruction, or our objectives of foreign language indicator, is to catalyze the development of anticipatory dispositions that enables complex, nuanced, recipient aware, nimble, and improvisational communication capacity. If you know Steve, you know that if the word is less than you know, four syllables, it's not you know, really interested. And so, and then you put them, strings them in long sentences together. But the idea here is, is obviously to um, present foreign language education not so much as a cookie cutter kind of approach where we're going to memorize a you know, long list of uh, vocabulary, vocabulary or grammar rules, but rather uh, to uh, equip students with the, uh, the, the skills to actually uh, interact in the language, with the language, uh, and uh, sort of make sense of the situation wherever the situation, or whatever the situation may be. So um, in order to do that, um, uh, I've been trying to design learning uh, and language learning environments that uh, focus exactly on those skills and try to develop a broader view of, of uh, foreign language teaching. So uh, today I prepared 117 slides. Um, so we'll be here until about seven. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I have a lot more material that I'm probably going to be able to, to present, but I'm going to focus primarily on a, uh, a, a project that, um, as uh, Steve mentioned, I've conducted with a colleague in German. Maria Stelle, and um, uh, also because it's a program that, that I think could resonate with some of the things that perhaps you're, you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, and I know that's one that, that uh, kind of piqued Stefan's uh, interest a little bit. And so, uh, and then I'll tell you in the conclusion some of the other things that are going on or, or ways in which you can think about some of these issues in different contexts. Um, so um, the easy way of doing this interconnected foreign language curriculum um, is a uh, thing that I call international is the curriculum at home. Not all of my students at least, uh, and that nationwide there is evidence that not very many students uh, go abroad. And so sometimes uh, we're always thinking of oh, establishing partnerships with uh, institutions abroad. Yeah, that's great. I've done this, the collaboration, fabulous. But if you don't have the, the, the means of the access to technology or the scheduling, um, flexibility, and so on and so forth, then you can actually look for partnerships a lot closer to home. In this case, um, with a, a, a German colleague, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, soon. Uh, first, let's uh, stop a little bit and look at what we mean by internationalization. There is a myriad of definitions. Um, so I, I, uh, I kept three quotes that I think sort of frame this, um, um, or two quotes and frame this a, a little bit better. One is the process of integrating an international, uh, intercultural or global dimension into the purpose, function or delivery of higher education at the institutional level. Um, and another one is a complex, multi-dimensional uh, learning process that indicates 
the integrative, intercultural, interdisciplinary, comparative, transfer of knowledge, technology, contextual, and global dimensions of knowledge construction. These all combine to form what we refer to as an international mindset. Right? So um, this idea of, of reasoning about the object that occupies us for the moment, which is foreign language education, in a much broader context. Um, and uh, my work tends to draw from the frameworks of social cultural theory and uh, multiple literacies. And so it, it is very, I'm not going to do the whole catechism, but you know, you know it as well as I do. Um, but um, that's sort of what informs the way the course is built and the kinds of activities that are going on in it. So why this course and, and what is it? So it is um, a course, um, the French section is housed in the Department of Modern Foreign Language and Literatures. It's a multi-language department. We offer currently nine languages. Uh, the usual suspect of you know, French and German and Italian and Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, Arabic. These are the nine languages that we offer, which is very small in comparison to the, the broad offerings that you can find at an institution like Colombia, but that's kind of where we live. Uh, and uh, it is, um, so I, I collaborate with this colleague in German. It's two panel courses on contemporary culture that are offered at the, at the advanced level, so they count as upper division courses. And we constructed two parallel curricula. Um, there is no, unfortunately, there is no official or institutional framework for team teaching, so we had to jerry something by just kind of scheduling, you know, she and I in the background saying, okay, I'm not going to offer the course at that, you know, that day at that time, we don't tell anyone. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, and it all worked out because we have some sort of, uh, I, I have complete control over the scheduling of the French courses, and she had some modicum of control over the scheduling of the German course, so that worked out very well. Um, we, we uh, as I said, we designed the curriculum completely collaboratively uh, or around an overarching theme that we then explored through uh, four uh, different axes, and that I, I will uh, show them to you. Um, the goal was to engender this sort of critical awareness in our students and foster the development of graduates who are truly international in their outlook, um, as if studying just one more foreign language was not enough. We wanted them to uh, be exposed to two foreign cultures and then uh, put this in uh, two things. First, put it in mirror of the American culture and to couch these two uh, foreign cultures, French and German, in the broader European context. Uh, so the, uh, another idea was to you know, operate in, in an environment that was translatable and transcultural. I'm sure you've all read assiduously the uh, 2007 NLA report that says we need to foster a translatable and transcultural competence in our students. So it's nice and swell, but clearly how do we do that? Well, we need to um, uh, organize uh, uh, moments, I guess, at least in our curriculum, if we don't want to take it to the level of you know, program design systematically, but at least have moments where the students see multiple languages coexist in the same environment and, and try to establish these connections between languages and between cultures. Um, and then develop students' ability to work collaboratively with diversity, complexity, and ambiguity. Um, you, you will see from the, uh, the, the, types, the types of activities uh, that we have, we're not about telling students this is what French people think, this is what German people think, and you as Americans think that. Quite the opposite, it's not about um, memorizing the right answer, it's more about learning to formulate the right questions uh, and the right hypothesis, right? So, so that was why this course was brought to bear uh, and also this uh, the realization that we do have changing societies. And whereas um, the top part of the slide is what most students are familiar with, which is traditional stereotypes about French and German cultures, um, France and Germany today look, look a lot more like the bottom of the slide than they do like the top of the slide, even though there is, of course, necessarily always tension, not in the sense of um, uh, frictions necessarily, as much as in the sense of electric tension. You know, there's always connections and, and, and dialogues between these two uh, slides, uh, or halves. So our goals with this sort of experimental class was, was to ask new or perhaps different questions to challenge our own as educators as well as our students' perspectives um, to form new hypotheses and test them. 
see, okay, well, we've learned this about French culture, how does that compare to German culture, and then what can, what can we then uh, keep from these hypotheses? Are these confirmed, or are they disproved? Um, then develop and explore new perspectives. <coughs> Attempt to understand change in Germany and France as it is couched in the European context and also change in the US. And then um, uh, sort of add to our unique and different perspectives as, as people from Europe. Uh, Maria Schkeda is from Germany, I'm from France. Um, so we're both living sort of in exile uh, you know, in the United States. And then our students who do study European cultures and languages um, who perhaps want to go and live abroad, study abroad, work abroad, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or work with a foreign or international component, um, and then position all of us in different positions as, as, as experts, right? Because we ask, you'll see, we ask the French students in French to be experts of French culture when they presented it to the Germans, and vice versa. And then uh, neither Maria nor I can claim, you know, expert status with regard to American culture because this is a culture that we. Uh, or learning, nor can we claim expert status for French and German culture, by the way, I would, I would argue that we're always learning that as well, in as much as it is uh, changing. We have two iterations of the class, I'm going to focus more on the second one. Um, the first one in 2009, we focused, the overarching theme was about youth identity formation in urban settings, focusing primarily on Paris and Berlin, and then the second one was on the concept of borders in French and uh, German and American culture um, and European culture in general and American culture. Uh, so we had, uh, as I said, separate curricula and every about three weeks, we would have one week that was dedicated to having the two groups of students meet and talk to each other. Um, so we had readings that sort of parallel um, each other where uh, we say, well, you'll see like one, the first one was on stereotypes, for example, so they read a little bit about this and then we came together and we gave them new materials that dealt with stereotypes to where they had to apply what they had learned to this new material and then reflect on French, German, US, and European cultures. Um, we had various kinds of activities that foster one, the sort of the necessary uh, introspective gesture that goes with cultural learning. Remember, you, know, the, you cannot uh, learn another culture unless you've made your own cultural lenses salient. What um, uh, Aslan Maston called the le mode par défaut, the default mode, right? Which is your own culture as organizing the principle of your own activity and human condition. Um, so, for example, when uh, Americans say French people eat too late, it's not true. It's American people who eat way too early, <laughs> right? See, that kind of sort of normative, um, that's a very mundane you know, example, but to give you the kind of normative uh, dimension of, the, of our own cultural frames. Um, and then uh, various types of documents, you try to engage with various modalities of representation of culture, so text, films, photographs, songs, um, and so on and so forth. So as I said, the, the first uh, meeting uh, of that semester, we had three common meetings, was on stereotype and the European project. This is a very uh, sort of common picture these days. <laughs> yeah. Francois and Angela seem to have a uh, little romance going on on the side, being in Ukraine or elsewhere. Um, and, um, and this is the kind of activities that, so that's if you have your cell phones or your, where you can uh, turn them on, this is the kind of activities that we do with students. Um, where um, the idea is, that, oh, you cannot read the top, but is uh, what, in your opinion, what stereotypes of, uh, of American culture what stereotypes of Americans would members of the cultures you teach have? Does that make sense? That's the question. So if I teach French, what stereotypes of American do French people hold? Right? So if you teach Italian, if you teach Russian, if you teach something else. So what, what stereotypes of Americans do uh, people in your cultures hold? If you want to play, you can uh, respond to that, or you can text. Set to 37601 and then text your message and you'll see that will uh, appear on the screen, maybe, perhaps, or maybe not. Let me give you an example of a, of a very uh, easy activity that you can have as a class opener with students. Um, 
to get them thinking about who they are as Americans or who people think they are as Americans. Or... No response received. Oh, there you go. Americans eat too much and work too much. There you go. That's a good one. And the beauty as with this, as you can see, is that it's anonymous. So people really go to town with, uh, they don't hold back, you know? <laughs> it's a no holds bar kind of a, <laughs> kind of a thing. <clears throat> so, there you go, Americans are too informal. There you go. We talked about that class today. I teach French, yeah, with me. Talk about the ingredients, like the forms of dress. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and then you can, you can, because um, of course these stereotypes, they all exist for a reason, right? And so the beauty of this is that they all somehow anchored in some sort of reality. Okay? But then you have this that you can bring to bear in the way these are framed. You know, it's too, not enough, you know, this sort of better or worse. So instead of, why, why, why would French people say that Americans are too informal, for example? So how is politeness done in French and American culture? In what context and how is it different from maybe region to region? Because uh, I guarantee you, politeness is not the same way in New York City than it is in, you know, Tennessee, Tennessee for example. <laughs> so, I guess. Um, and so, you know, as much as you have a trace of all these things and they're not attached to any particular student, you can use that as an object of study in class and have, have students discuss that. And so we did. Um, these are some of the questions that we ask. Well, what stereotypes do you think French and Germans uh, or Europeans have of Americans? For the French students, what stereotypes do you have of German of Germans or Germany? And then same thing with the German students. Um, and then of course we got you know the usual you know the wine and picnic and the baguette and the saucisson and then the beer fest and then the golden arches, right? But. It's expected, right? And then you, you, so you start from there because you can choose, you can say, oh, well, that's so rudimentary. Yeah, maybe. But at the same time, this is where your students are and you start here. Um, they may not have, they may not be able to bridge that gap. And then you, they just, it's a non-starter. They just stay there because you, you don't hook them, right? So um, then we, based on this, we looked at a little bit of the German context. So what, what is Germany? What is German in the 21st century? Who is German in the 21st century? Um, and you know, examine the set of tensions that define Germany or Germanness in the context of, of Europe and the globalizing world, the notions of pessimism, optimism. Uh, here that's a picture of the Berlin Wall. That's the um, <clears throat> when the wall came down, um, and some of the some of the topics that we engaged here. Um, and then fast forwarding to today's Germany. Um, that's, that's for you, that one up top. <laughs> uh, but looking at you know, Germany's strong economy, uh, is it because or in spite of the euro, uh, the expert oriented economy, economic aid or expectation, solidarity versus anchor vis a vis uh, for European countries, social tensions, immigration, integration, and multiculturalism, and then looking at you know picture of German youth. Then we looked at the French context. Same thing, same kinds of questions. Um, looking at um, things like you know the regional legacies, the 2005 riots, uh, the, the debate under Sarkozy on national identity. If you remember, Sarkozy was like, okay, so what does it mean to be French today? We need to defend French identity. I'm like, okay, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, what 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 French identity? When did we have one French identity? Well, maybe at the late 18th century, but I don't think it was born then, so it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it did, so we did do that. And so coming to this idea of coming, coming to grips with multiple identities, because I think we are now in a, in a, for maybe the first time since the advent of the Republic where French people I, I, at least contemplate the, the possibility of having multiple identities without that being a threat to national identity or security for that matter. Um, and then same thing, this notion of pessimism versus optimism, and of course if it was today we could talk about things like the Charlie Hebdo um, uh, assassinations, <clears throat> um, the importance of history uh, in France, uh, I don't know if you remember, this is of course uh, you know, remains of World War II in Saint-Périglise, 
with the paratroopers, and I don't know if you remember this caricature that was famous when uh, the UK was trying to enter the European Union, and, and uh, De Gaulle has this condition pour l'entrée de la Grande Bretagne. And so he has all these conditions that are one more absurd than the other, and, and then is the, you cannot see the bubble, but it says, uh, I think that's a bit too short, then actually go for it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then again, looking at uh, now broadening the, you know, zooming out a little bit and looking at, okay, now we have this sort of, you know, famous uh, French-German couple as the axis of, or the, the, you know, the pillars of the European Union, for better or for worse, and looking at this within the context of the historical past, you know, two, you have two countries that I mean, were literally at each other's throats for centuries. Um, and and uh, how, how has that influenced where we are today? So looking at the past to understand the present and looking at the future. Uh, and that future is, you know, France, Germany and Europe. So this is some of the, again, some of the questions that we ask. Why is it so important to um, this, you know, couple is so important for the European Union, this idea that, um, you know, why, why the European Union may be the most political, I mean, ambitious political project of the 21st century, or maybe ever, is because literally you have two countries that wanted each other's annihilations for, you know, hundreds of years, and all of a sudden this, uh, decided that, yeah, maybe it is with your enemy that you need to make peace the most, and then build on this. Um, what are the challenges? Uh, what, how does that compare to the challenges that the U.S. is facing moving forward uh, with the integration of, of uh, increasingly diverse communities and um, then challenges uh, brought more broadly for, for the future of Europe and the U.S. Um, some of the questions that, that, um, that we asked about that, just, uh, just to give you an idea of, because I, I think uh, Steve is going to make the, the PowerPoint available, so I, I, I tried to put in actual course materials for, for you to um, draw from some of the discussion or reflection questions that, that we asked the students to uh, ponder. So then fast forward three more weeks, week six meeting was about borders, both geographical and metaphorical, and this is, uh, you know, a little caricature of uh, Turkey trying to get into Europe. Sweet Turkey, bread food. Yeah. So, um, again, looking at uh, uh, picture analysis, so we took uh, a collage of uh, uh, actual borders between European countries. Uh, a lot of them are between France and Germany, but not all of them. Um, and. Um, you know, asking students to reflect on, on this idea of borders and what they need. Um, the history of the French borders, the history of the German borders. Um, you know, just to focus on France for a little bit, you know, the, the, uh, some of the exp expansionist uh, history, the particular case of Alsace-Lorraine, the colonial empire, the now, you know, hexagon, which is nice and pretty and all neat, and then, what that means within the, you know, the, the, the construct of the Schengen space, uh, and then internal borders, you know, tackling things like regional identity, which completely gets. Um, I found that at least in the in the available didactic material, when we talk about region, we talk about uh, the, maybe the gastronomy and this and that and the other thing, but we we really forget to talk about what that meant for French history to have these regions. I mean, not about a hundred years ago when France went to war. Uh, in 1914, uh, the regiments were organized by a geographical area because people spoke languages that were not mutually intelligible and it would have been a disaster, not that it wasn't, but it would have been a disaster to try to mix them all together because they couldn't be sent to fight, right? Um, and, uh, and so then we talk, talked about France as this very monolithic, Supposedly, very uh, fixed idea of yeah, la grandeur de la nation and the national identity. And the, that's a hundred years ago. That's yesterday, right? Um, and so, um, and then other, other kinds of internal borders, like you know, maybe between genders or with uh, things like handicap, for example, or ethnic uh, communities, and so on and so forth. So, uh, again, have. Uh, we, we uh, have students reflect on what borders might exist in American culture. If you live in the South, hardly does a week go by when you don't hear Mason Dixon, for example. You know that's one border, uh, or you know that kind of thing. So, and then we showed them a short film. 
Paris by Night, which is a, a beautiful film um, by a filmmaker called Tony Gatif that you may know. He has a lot of, he made, he's made a lot of, of uh, good movies, but good movies. But it's about these uh, these uh, immigrants who are trying to get. It's a short film. It's uh, part of a 24 movie collection of five minute clips that are called European Visions, uh, looking at. Uh, Looking at the construction of the European Union, it is by uh, directors from all countries of the European Union. Um, so, looking at these these uh, immigrants that are coming into Paris, uh, you know, because Paris by night, of course, before students watch the movie, they think about Paris nightlife, right? So you know, let's go to the opera and uh, have a good dinner, and then you know, the film is in black and white. It's very uh, very tense atmosphere. The picture is not very clear, um, and then it's the story of these three uh, illegal immigrants really trying to get into into Paris, right? Um, and so um, think about what kind of national, cultural, linguistic, symbolic borders and barriers are depicted in this movie. What is the role of the gays? A lot of close-up shots of people looking at. What are they looking at? Why? Are they, I mean, who are they looking? Who are they? These people who are looking? Who are they? And what are they looking at? And how? Uh, some of the stereotypes that are used. What role do they play? the symbolism of the closing scene. And then the, the pendant to that for German was a clip from a movie called Im Juli that uh, you may know if you, it was very famous, uh, a very famous, um, uh, very successful uh, uh, film by a, another great filmmaker called Fatih Akim. Um, and it's about the story of the, this guy who's trying to uh, um, go and um, because his father died, and they, so he has to go back to uh, Turkey, and messy. So he does cross borders, and but it's not just a direct, the ge geographical borders that become problematic. Of course, it's all the symbolic borders that he has to go through. And so these these are uh, some of the questions that that uh, we uh, ask students. And then I'm going to show you a quick clip of uh, a um, uh, British. A uh, slam artist called uh, Holly McNish, because we showed the students this clip and they said, okay, now what would this sound like in American culture? Because it is in English. So you can see again this idea of, of working with different kinds of uh, media and, and uh, formats, so we'll see if that works. Maybe it didn't work. Is it going to work? Maybe it will work. I think it will work. He said those goddamn Pakistan names and then goddamn Shops. Built a shop on every corner, took our British workers' jobs. He said those goddamn Chinese and their goddamn China shops. I told him they're from Vietnam, but he doesn't give a toss. I ask him what was there before the damn Japan man shop. He looks at me and dreams a scene of British workers' jobs. A full time, full employment before the goddamn bonesaw came, where everybody went to work for full time, full weeks every day. A British business stood there first, he claims before the Irish came. Now British people lost their jobs and bloody Turkish there to blame. I asked him how he knows that fact. He said, because it's true. I asked him how he knows that fact. He said, he read it in the news. Every time a Somalian comes here, they take a job from us. The mathematics one from one from us to them, it just adds up. He buys his cake. He sips his brew. He says again, he knows this plot. The goddamn Caribbeans came and now the folk here don't have jobs. I ask him what was there before the goddamn Persian curtain shop. I show him architectures, plans of empty goddamn plots of land. I show him the historic maps, a bit of sand, a barren land. There was no goddamn shop before the Pakistani came and planned. Man, I'm sick of crappy mathematics, because I love a bit of sums. I spend three years into economics and I geek out over calculus. And when I meet these paper claims that one of every new that came takes away one's daily wage, I desperately want to scream your maths is stuck in primary. Some who come here also spend, and some who come here also lend, and some who come here also tend to set up work which employs them, and all your balance sheets and trends, they work with numbers, not with men. And all this goddamn heated talk ignores the trade the Polish bought, ignores the men they give work to, not plumbing jobs, but further to. Ignores the guys they buy stock from, accountants, builders, on and on, and I know it's nice to have someone to blame our lack of jobs upon, but immigration's not that plain. Despite the sums inside your brain, that's one for one. It's him for you. It's if he goes, they employ you, because sometimes one that comes makes two, and sometimes one can add three more, and sometimes two times two is much, much more than four. 
and most times immigrants bring more than minuses. So, um, as you can imagine, in a state, you have to take precautions with this type of material because I live in the states that and it, it really warmed my heart when I um, heard that on the radio this week that has the most mega churches per capita in the United States. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and so um, you, you have to take precautions with this kind of material because it's not. But at the same time, I think that it is our responsibility as educators in general, and foreign foreign language educators in particular, to shake the ground a little bit for our students, as long as we give them the means to handle it, so that the ground does not shake at the end of the course. But um, and so we, you know, we we dealt with that. So okay, now transpose that across the Atlantic. Uh, in the uh, American context, what would that look like? What are the communities that would be featured? Um, and so on and so forth. So, fast forward another three weeks. Again, uh, under this overarching uh, uh, theme of borders, um, a unit on football and racism. Uh, if you remember, uh, that was back in the days when uh, France won the World Cup in 1998, and then uh, shortly thereafter, we had uh, a series of uh, interior ministers who were particularly uh, severe uh, with the uh, immigration laws, and so we had massive amounts of deportations, and uh, the return home, as it was called. And uh, so here you have you know, football at the, you know, in the charter plane. Uh, even in the charter plane, uh, we celebrate France, the multicultural France. And then you have the police officer who said, yeah, we, we even took out the, the gags and everybody saying we are the champions, we are the champions of their return, being returned to their quote unquote home countries because it's not really their home anymore, but anyway. Um, and so um, again, same thing, you know, what do you associate with things like soccer, soccer fan culture, sports fan in the US, and then reflect on this a little bit. Um, and then uh, we showed a film, which is a documentary called No Colors. It's a 2000, it's about a 30 minute 2007 documentary. Um, it's part of the series, Crossroads Inside the European Union, Films for the Humanities. Um, and it's, uh, um, it, it, a large part of that documentary focuses on some of the uh, issues around racial tensions and differences that arose in, uh, in uh, football. Uh, as we call it on the other side of the big pond, because um, we play with our feet. Most of American football. Um, and uh, the and so uh, you know the, we had the students look at this. Um, what are what are these uh, uh, racist uh, tensions uh, emblematic of or, or symptomatic of, if you will, in the uh, cultural system, you know, landscape? So we showed them the movie. And then we had we divided the, the the class in four groups, and we get, we give each group uh, one set of questions to ponder for the remaining of the of the time period. And then the following time period that week, we had them report to the class, and then uh, engage with that question at the end of the class. How do these discussions compare to the questions <coughs> of racism and religion that the U.S. faces? Uh, and do these questions also play out in, in professional or college sports, right? So <clears throat> that gives rise to some interesting um, uh, discussion. So then fast forward again uh, uh, a few more weeks and uh, we went to a session where all they had to do was apply. So what do we mean by that? We divided the group, the class in, in uh, groups of uh, no more than four students and they had to be uh, half and half French students and German students, and we give them uh, a list of 12 scenarios. So uh, uh, I'll give you a, a few of your, uh, your students who are in an apartment with, uh, with friends, um, and uh, you, um, uh, one of them will go abroad for a year, and you're interviewing students to find another roommate. So one of the, that's the first one, I'll show you an example of that. Uh, or you're an international student sitting at a cafe terrace in France or in Germany or in the US, you start debating the relationship between language and identity based on, uh, I don't know if, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the, the French movie L'Auberge Espagnole, the Spanish apartment, right, where they, there is this, this scene in a, in a cafe where they're talking about uh, the relationship between uh, language and identity being you know, French, Catalan, Spanish, 
uh, and then you have around the table you have a student from, from France, one from Belgium, one from Catalonia, one from Spain, um, one from South America, and they all, you know, how this all kind of plays together. Uh, so it's sort of um, um, a la kind of type of activity. Um, so they had a list of, you know, like I said, 12 scenarios, and that was it. So, okay, these are the scenarios. You're in group, you pick one, take your cell phones, YouTube capture, one take, go upload, and then we'll come back and we look at these films as objects of study then, and what's that, what's that work in there. And so I'll show you one example of what that looked like, not the whole thing, because I think it's about uh, between six and seven minutes, but I, I, I'll show you a little bit. And then, um, <coughs> let you realize that the, you know, pull everywhere thing, you know, if you have the app, you can actually have it run in the background to where you can insert it in your PowerPoint slide, and it's very seamless. Oh. Yeah, I thought that's what I, that's what I, hold on. Yeah, she kept coming in on my own day like at the university for the semester. It's got to be a minimum swing down. There she is. And I'm in the room. Where are you from? You turn up. Where you're from, and introduce uh, yourself a little bit. Yeah, okay, uh, my name is Yoni, uh, I'm from Germany, and um, we uh, came here to do some traveling, and now I'm at like, the university for a semester. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Gemma from Essex, that's in England, and I am not in school right now, but I'm just here to have a bit of fun. I love America, love American boys, so yeah, let's just have a great time and hang out. Um, uh, hello, um, I am Colette, uh, I am from Paris, obviously. <laughs> Um, All right. Um, how do you feel about sharing a bit? Um, yeah. Well, uh, I, I really like my uh, my my privacy. Um, yeah. No, it's, that's yeah. It's not not okay at all. Um, but yeah, I cannot really go back. So you get the idea of um, um, obviously. Um, so the, the big this idea, of, you know, the, the scenario of finding a new roommate, so interviewing. Uh, all these are students that are obviously from the U.S., from Tennessee, in fact, all three of them, all four of them, and. Um, so they had to, they, they chose to play these characters, you know, with the German boy who was, uh, the American boy rather, who was the, the guy who was doing the interviews, and then three uh, female candidates, one was from Germany, England, and France. And so then they had to decide how they were going to portray Germanness and Frenchness and Englishness, you know. <laughs> uh, and so what's interesting in those types of projects is not so much um, the content of these, is what, well, or the quality, I guess, of, of these is, is how they chose to do this. Because then, when you when you turn around and you take these as objective studies, and you're like, okay, so why did you choose to do it this way? Right? What's behind this, and uh, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish, and why is, uh, and so then you can link it further to issues of, you know, how do you define intimacy in German culture versus American culture versus like in what culture would it be okay to share a room, or a bedroom, a, a yeah, a bedroom or a bathroom? And to what to what extent? You know, where are the you know the uh, the 
uh, the, 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 what is the protocol, I guess, if you will, to, to manage these types of relationship, right? So that's that's interesting beyond just producing these these uh, these objects or these texts, if you will, <coughs> broadly defined. Um, so before I, I move to the conclusion, uh, I wanted to uh, give you uh, some of the. Um, the feedback that we got from the students um, about about this this particular collaboration. So first, you have the not so good. And the, the, these are long excerpts from either interviews that I transcribed or uh, feedback journals that they had to journal their experiences every week. Um, and uh, so I highlighted some of the things that. Uh, so my opinion about the integration of the German culture class and ours has varied throughout the semester. At first. Uh, thought it would be a really great way of bringing together the two different mindsets of the culture. The German culture being something I knew very little uh, about, aside from the Nazis, beer, and bread uh, I was more than excited to hear a little more in the context we were discussing in our own section. So, not so bad, but then it, said it became more difficult to keep everyone on topic instead of talking about personal workload and spring break plans. Maybe it was just a condition of my group changing from week to week, and I lost a truly interested students and found some who were just in for the credits. And then at the end also, I had some problems truly understanding the German aspect of the discussion because I lacked the resources needed to fully understand that side of the issue. And so we um, looked at this a little bit, and uh, Maria and I, and, and we found that there were, there were groups that were very uh, asymmetrical, where you had one side of the group that was very engaged and would have loved to go forward, and, and, uh, and the other who was not so interested. And of course, um, that doesn't work if you have that kind of thing. So in the first iteration of the class, it, it was very apparent because uh, I had a very small group of students and my students were outnumbered of one to two. Um, and, but what that meant is when we had the common session, we had over 50 students in the room, which made it very hard to manage. Um, and there was a lot of room for uh, people to not stay on task. Right? So, the second iteration, we had a lot less of this because we had a much smaller group, and then it was uh, uh, they were also all at a higher level, I think, generally speaking, and more more engaged. So it worked. So better. The small group discussion gave me further insight into how the Germans feel about immigrants. Not bad. Uh, in many places in Europe, there seems to be such a struggle to preserve the ways of the past and the homogeneity of uh, the uh, homogeneity of the culture. I have not decided if I view this as a good thing or not, but I'm looking forward to exploring the issue further this semester. So, that's this is the kind of thing that you want to see. People who are finally setting the wheels in motion. Like I, 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 I don't know how I feel about this, but at least I'm starting to ask questions as opposed to trying to find an, an answer that I can, you know, like a soundbite answer that I can then, you know, place at cocktail parties. Um, uh, even better when you have students who say things like this. It has been a great semester in which I truly feel that my ideas, perspectives, and opinions have grown and changed based on what we have discussed and learned. Um, and then I think that meeting with the German students was a great idea because it taught me a lot about Europe and European relations as a whole, which is something I have uh, I had never studied or learned about. Um, so uh, again, you see this idea of, of, of really questioning your beliefs and values and then potentially shifting these values and beliefs and perspectives. Um, as in, in addition to running content, which is always good, but uh, to be at least at this point not really the primary concern. Um, better yet again, almost you know on the verge of good. Uh, the class definitely opened up my eyes to new aspects of American and French culture, as well as, as, well as a little German culture, and it really made me question a lot of things about myself as well. So I really felt like we were we are we were able to create in the classroom more than a simple student teacher relationship. We were definitely a community. What I have learned and experienced in this class, I will be able to take with me in my future pursuits. I know myself a little better. I know America and France a little better. So now we're starting to get into some really interesting uh, areas where you start questioning and putting into question on a consistent basis who you are and what you believe in. Um, Two, when you start thinking, you know, envisioning there's a potential of what you've just learned uh, to apply to different contexts, um, and then um, uh, and then this idea of uh, strength in number, you know, forming a community, knowledge construction by crowdsourcing is what we're really after here, um, and then you have the truly exceptional student. Uh, 
who says identity is an ever-transforming concept, one created on a personally individualistic level, but that expands in complexity when you consider its role on a local, national, or global uh, arena. Identity presents itself in our language, literature, behaviors, beliefs, fashion, music, and more. It's how we present ourselves, how we, are, we see ourselves, how others see us. What's so interesting about identity is its subjectivity, its objective quality, seeing it change over time, space, and context. The effect of shifting locations creates further intricacies in identities. National belongings change when borders are crossed, while people with diverse linguistic background cross borders with relative, relative ease, and those on the margin develop perspectives with exclusive insights. With so many factors playing a role in our identity constructs, it can be difficult to reconcile that fact that we are actively assembling our own versions of truth about the world. In class, an example was given concerning the building of a monument of knowledge, always shifting as each piece, as each new piece, new piece is added to the structure. Our environment acts on us and we return the favor. As architects of knowledge, we might find a way to control the design by avoiding the limitations produced by stagnant perspectives. Through learning of new languages, by crossing space and borders, seeking the margins and challenging the perceptions others have taken towards us, with a capital O no less. Transform transformation, growth, change, and opportunity for liberation. So when you get to that level of reflection and understanding of what's at stake in these types of learning opportunities, then you know you've, you've really made a difference. Because this is somebody who now understands that truth is always socio-historically and culturally constructed. That this idea of overarching truth, uh, even in the scientific community, is something that is under heavy fire, uh, and for good reasons. That uh, who you are uh, is certainly not fixed, but also changes every time you, like several times a day, potentially. Um, and that uh, identity is not just who you think you are, but who others think you are, or how they see you. This idea of you know going back to Bartin and you know the whole social psychology thing of the self as co-authored by the other. Um, and so uh, you, when, when you have this kind of, uh, of uh, transformation in a student, then you know you've done what you were supposed to do. Um, so then we get to the conclusion of this uh, course, which uh, would serve as an apt conclusion for this talk which is this idea of globalization, France, Germany, Europe, and the USA. So um, remember one of the goals was to engage the, 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 the idea of perspectives as uh, and perhaps changing perspectives or new perspectives or different perspectives. And so we looked at things like belonging, identity, nationality, and the global <coughs> world, notion of people, languages, stories, sounds, uh, cross borders, um, Trace the border crossing crossings in various domains, uh, literature, film, music, but also uh, not just geographical borders, but other types of borders. Um, ways in which we can trace shifting borders uh, of identity and national belonging, and then meaning making as always negotiated and intersubjective discourse, not so much uh, uh, something that is uh, ready, chewable bits. Another uh, objective behind this class uh, and these types of collaboration is to be able to have students engage with these types of uh, uh, performance. What, that, you know, what do these pictures tell you? What kind of identity or identities are being performed in things like this? So you go to Germany or France, you see this in the street. You gotta be able to get a sense of what's happening. It's like, okay, this is France. I get this, now what's going on, right? It's not the Eiffel Tower, it's not a baguette. And it's not a camembert either. So what do I do with this? Or perhaps more recently, being able to engage with something like this. I put it there because since uh, all English-speaking news outlet decided to really not show it, I figured that should, you know I would show it here. Uh, <laughs> and um, but you know, kind of understand okay, what's going on in, in something like this? What what is at stake here? Um, and this idea of being able to engage with this, with this uh, notion of changing society. So we explore the question of cultural similarities and differences. We question the future, uh, as in you know, what's going to happen to this notion of living together that we're supposedly constructing. Um, and we ask students what role they were ready to play in that uh, process, as, uh, in the process of constructing this living together um, as educated, responsible, global citizens. And so, in the five minutes or so 
that uh, maybe I have left. I will show you where I think this could be going in some of the projects that I'm working on right now. One, the notion of linguistic landscapes and how to construct, to, to uh, tend to the ecology around us uh, in a much more deliberate fashion to look at how we can unpack what's going on. This is a collection of pictures that I, um, students that I took in, in uh, France. Um, and uh, that, you know, they're just a few of many. But okay, so what's going on in here? So something like Bar du Lycée, right? The high school bar, which is something that you would never see in the US, right? <laughs> because high school students are not drinking at all. No, ever. Ever, ever, right? Um, or this kind of you know inclusion of English in the in the landscape, like underwear, underwear for men. Or another one that uh, I find uh, interesting. Uh, oh, you, uh, you don't see it. it's kind of covered. The, there is this the very top one on the right corner here is a uh, a shop called Huiclo, which is incidentally the Sartre uh, play No Exit. That's the French title, Huiclo. And it's a, the, their, it's an interior design shop. And their, uh, their uh, slogan is, partner of comfort. Now, for something called Huiclo, we, we have to do something with this, right? I mean, so, so it's this idea of, of having students tend to the language in public spaces, right? And, and partnering with the community at large, the geography at large. Another one is um, students as authors. Writing to Think, so uh, it's another project that I did with students where they, they engage in collaborative writing. Uh, each It was a grammar class, so it was a, a, this idea of engaging as with grammar as meaning making rather than grammar as a set of rules. And the students were divided in groups and each of them has to contribute one short story. And the only guideline that they had was that that short story had to somehow include some element of intercultural exploration. So some decided to do something about gender between men and women, something about North versus South, something about France versus the US. And they all worked together. They edited each other's work. I edited their work. Um, and uh, this idea was that, OK, look, we're going to write a book, and we're going to publish it on iBooks. And it's there if you want to go read it, for those of you who read French. And so you, you have to keep the audience in mind. And I guarantee you that it slides the fire into their chair. Um, Another example is um, a couple projects that we're working on right now about game-based learning. Um, if um, you're not familiar with the work of somebody like Jim G, you need to go to YouTube or the library and, and uh, brush up in, in a hurry. He's arguing about not so much that we should have all students play video games, although I, I think he might argue that in private, but not in public. And that's certainly not what I'm arguing, but where I think he has a very good point is why are games so good at teaching you to play the game? And what principles of, of game design can we learn to put together pedagogies that will motivate students to learn? So I have a couple of graduate students right now who are working on a first-year game called Où est la liberté? It's a story of, uh, you know, the, the La liberté qui dans le was stolen from the roof and the students have to go and find it. And so they're using the metro in Paris as a sandbox to kind of go around and practice French. And then they have different stops where they have to go and solve enigmas so that they can get clues, so that they can find who stole La Liberté qui dans le peuple, the famous de la croix painting. And, uh, and that's at the first year level. But I bet you dimes to dollars that the students will just eat it up because it's fun, right? And then I'm working all, uh, also with a lecture about a second on the second year game, retracing the relationship between Knoxville and French history, uh, where again the students it's a place-based game. Students are going to go to different places in Knoxville on their little smartphones and uh, collect clues and retrace history. And uh, uh, and, and again, it will connect them uh, in more serious ways uh, with uh, their own community in as, as, in as much as it relates to French. What is interesting in those uh, things is, uh, and, and uh, where I think it's important for the purpose of, of this talk is because you cannot do this alone. So I'm collaborating with, I have undergraduate students knocking at the door who are computer scientists, who are uh, artists, uh, uh, or design majors, because they want to just play and work on this project. And so you create synergies between foreign language education and what we can do with it. because. 
people don't learn foreign languages just to pass the foreign language requirement, even though it's a big part of it. Um, they, you know, they, they have to have a better reason to learn a foreign language than just that, right? Um, and if you want to take it at a very, you know, much larger level, this is a project that's going on at the University of Oregon in their Center for Language Studies, the ECOPOD, the um, uh, Global Scholars Hall, Hall, and this is their idea, is that you're know, transforming the residential experience so that the students engage as multilingual participants in everyday life and make second language use part of their social, professional, and educational endeavors. So it, it integrates place-based experiences uh, in this residential immersive environment. So they have students living in this hall that are from all kinds of disciplines, foreign languages, political science, engineering majors, business majors, and so on and so forth, and they're working on real world problems. Three major axes. One is um, uh, sustainability, access to water, as, as in you know, potable, good water, and the other one is the disease er eradication. And um, I, I cannot help but think that these are the kind, now don't get me wrong, this type of initiative at that level takes a lot of work. There's a lot of sweat equity. I mean, even putting together a French or German, it takes work. Fine. Uh, it, that's the difference between wh where do we really want to take foreign language education in the 21st century, and or if we want to leave it stuck in the 19th century. That's the difference, right? Because I think that the, there is an economy of scale in, in forging these partnerships and not only making us relevant, not because we want to stay alive, but because we should be relevant. And if we're not advocating for our own in 2015, uh, we cannot count on university presidents and provosts to, uh, to uh, they don't even know we exist for reasons that defy understanding. They somehow miss the memo on globalization, right? And uh, it, it's, it, it, because they're not coming to get us, we need to make sure that they understand that these initiatives need to take place with foreign languages. Right? So, on that note, I will stop and take any questions you may have. Except that one. <laughs>